my name is Polong Lin. Uh, I'm a developer advocate uh, in the uh, Google Cloud Platform uh, team. And my focus is on uh, data science. Uh, and uh, as a developer advocate, actually, as a question for know what a developer advocate is. It's a very strange title to, to many people. So a developer advocate is someone who kind of, I would say, is a middle person between teams at Google and the outside world, essentially. So the reason why we exist is to help not only uh, bring awareness to some, uh, some products at Google, but also to take some feedback users from our customers, from the external community, and bring that feedback back to the product teams to help improve uh, the products at Google so that uh, there's a, you know, a better fit for, for, for the users out there. So as a developer advocate in data science, one of my focuses is around, of course, analytics, data science, machine learning, a bit of AI as well. And so here, uh, I am really happy to be here in Scotland. Uh, it's one of my favorite places. Um, uh, here to talk to you about machine learning at scale uh, with this product at Google called BigQuery. So the agenda today, um, I realize we don't have a full hour, which is fine. Uh, we'll see what we can get through here today. Um, cover a couple of different sections here. The first is just kind of around pandas and Python, just to give you a sense of what big data is like when you're trying to analyze. And some of the limitations that you might see when you're analyzing large amounts of data in uh, for those of you who, who may have already been working with Python, this might be quite, quite familiar. And then we're going to see how we can unlock some of these limitations by using something like BigQuery. And then further, to scale up machine learning using what's called uh, ML or BQML, as sometimes we, we might call it. So with BigQuery ML, we can now use machine learning at scale, and it's all in the cloud. And if there's a little bit of extra time, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, raise of hands. <laughs> Lots of hands. Um, so Jupyter Notebooks, uh, scaling that out in the cloud when, you know, Jupyter Notebooks, if you're trying to run Jupyter Notebooks on your computer or Jupyter Lab on your computer, and you find that your resources on your computer are simply not enough, something called AI Platform, where you're able to essentially uh, deploy these Jupyter Lab notebook environments in the cloud at the click of a button, and then you'll be running at a much larger, essentially virtual machine uh, in the cloud. So first uh, and foremost, I don't like to uh, go too far into the presentation without doing a, a quick demo. Um, here we have uh, Colab Notebook. So it's kind of a, a form of Jupyter Notebooks, uh, so to speak, uh, which allows you to run uh, Python code, uh, kind of like in a Jupyter environment, but via this tool called uh, Colab. Um, and here, what we're doing is simply bringing in some, some data and does. And we're just going to do some, some simple analyses. OK, so here we have some data that I've hosted on uh, Google Cloud Storage. And this is uh, Wikipedia data, uh, page requests by title uh, for the month of May 2015. And this is uh, this set here. So I've brought it into a pandas data frame. So this is something probably many of you are, are quite familiar with, read CSV. And then as we look at this data frame, I've only kind of subset of this data. Um, but you can see here, oh, I think this, this one didn't run here. Let me just uh, rerun this here. Uh, this should be 10 million rows that I brought into uh, this pandas data frame. So it's going to take 20 seconds, 30 seconds to download and to load. And then as you saw, there's uh, lots of different columns. And more importantly, there's lots of row rows in the data frame as well. And if you look at how large this data set is, how much memory used uh, in Python, we're looking at 380 megabytes. Um, and if you look at it more, more, more deeply, um, it actually goes up to uh, more than one gigabyte or close to one gigabyte of memory. What if we were to do some sort of simple data manipulation at, at scale with this kind of large data set? Well, if we look at just the first 100,000 rows, and if we were to look at uh, Wikipedia page request to see if that title that is being looked at contains a word start or help or anything else. So it's doing some sort of, um, you know, it's looks it's, it's data frame by condition for uh, the word start. 
It's then going to group by the title of that Wikipedia page, and it's going to take the sum of all the page views. So this is the request. And then it's going to sort it by the number of requests. So essentially what we have below is every single uh, Wikipedia page that starts with or contains the word start and the number of page views that have been uh, that corresponds to that particular title. So this is a very simple kind of data manipulation uh, script, so to speak, right? It's a very common thing to, to do this in Pandas. And we're, we've run this on 100,000 rows, so it's a, it's a fairly, I guess, healthy amount. How long did this take to run in Python? So we can import time, uh, create a little function to help track the amount of time it takes to run this data manipulation function. And as we see below, to process 100,000 rows, it's quick in Python. It only takes uh, nine one-hundredths of a second to process 100,000 rows. And then the question becomes, well, what happens if our data frame contains millions of rows, or tens of millions, or hundreds of millions of rows? Of How does that scale out in terms of the processing time? So what I did was I subsetted the data set so that it could be a little bit smaller and smaller and smaller. And we could see, by running the same script, how long it takes to analyze the data set, the same, um, to you know, group by and to do the ordering on uh, the data sets that are a little bit smaller in size. We find that as we increase, of course, the number of rows, it becomes quite a bit longer and longer to process the frame. So at 1,000 rows, very, very quick, 9 one thousandths of a second, but at uh, this is 10 million rows. This is now taking five seconds. And this is to look at you know, titles that start with or contain them. So if we were to plot this on a little plot, you can see as the number of rows increases by 10x, the amount of time, so in the y-axis we have the seconds uh, of time elapsed, starts to grow exponentially. So this is you know, 10 to the power of 7 in the bottom right-hand corner, right? 10 to the power of 7 and then 10 to the power of 3. So if we were to extra extrapolate this to 10 to the power of 8, 9, and 10, you can see it's going to take not seconds, but rather now in the order of minutes and then potentially hours as we continue to grow our data set. So this is very hard to scale, even for something simple like data manipulation in Python. So the operate, sorry, the observation the number of rows, as it increases, or the size of the data frame increases, the processing time in pandas will increase exponentially. So what if we were to do this on something like Google BigQuery instead? So if we were to do operation, but in uh, standard SQL, which is the language that's used to query data on BigQuery, um, so what we're doing here is, is we're selecting, exact, we're doing the exact same operation, selecting the title of the Wikipedia, the sum of all the page views from this particular table where the title contains the term start. And then we're going to group by the title and then order by the number of requests. And then finally, just 100 rows of the data. So as we execute this, uh, we'll see below uh, this took seven seconds. And then we see you know, Kickstarter, Lean Startup, any kind of titles that contain the word start. So uh, to run this in SQL only took seven seconds. But if you look at the number of rows that is actually in this BigQuery uh, table, and we can count you know, the number of uh, the rows, essentially, you see that there's actually um, 5.7 billion rows of data in which the same script, essentially, is being run on the data set. So if we're looking at that, this is 10 to the power of 9. And if uh, this graph, right, we'll be looking at the order of minutes. So, so at scale, when you're doing, at, doing any kind of data analysis and analytics, uh, the, the kind of takeaway here is that yes, in Pandas data frames, but as your data set grows to big data, then what you really want to do is try to do as many of the operations as you can where the data already currently sits, which is often in a database or in a data warehouse. And then once you have some of that data, then you can bring that back into Python and then do more with it if you want to visualize or create apps and so on. So do a lot of your bulk work. The heavy lifting should be done in something like BigQuery where there's, a, you know, th there's operations that help, uh, scale out your uh, analytics. So BigQuery is a completely fully managed uh, data warehouse in the cloud. 
And what that means is, as you saw here in this Colab notebook, I didn't have to worry about you know, scaling out the number of compute nodes, uh, scaling out the size of my virtual machines to run this query. This is simply a table that exists on BigQuery, and as I query it, it simply returns a result. As a data scientist, as a data analyst, I don't have to worry about what's happening in the background. I can just run my queries, and they can just work as if they're working with Pandas data frames as well. So it's fully managed. It's all in the cloud. It's enterprise ready, and so it's you know, lots of encryption and permissions-based settings that you can uh, tweak with BigQuery. And the reason why that BigQuery is so fast and also the way that it reduces its cost for is because of two things. Uh, number one is that it completely separates the idea of storing your data in a data warehouse and uh, compute, so analyzing your data and running your queries. And by storing your data, uh, replicate it across lots and lots of nodes, if you will, and distributing it across lots and lots of nodes, it can now do a lot of distributed comp uh, computations uh, via the compute, which is completely separate, and that can be scaled depending on the kinds of queries that you run. So in the end of the day, BigQuery becomes extremely scalable and extremely fast. And you also have different kinds of ways in which you can work with BigQuery that I'll talk about in a second. But so far, I haven't really talked about machines. So, um, so far, it's all been around data analytics and data manipulation uh, with SQL and, and Pandas. But what about machine learning at scale? Well, let me first preface with one of the challenges that you see in businesses machine learning. And here I've kind of highlighted three, but there's, of course, many more. Number one is it's very difficult to hire data scientists because they can be expensive and hard to train, or might be, you know, there's, there's, there's not enough uh, supply of data scientists. Number two is that it can be quite complex and time consuming to bring that data from some large data warehouse where perhaps a lot of your user behavior data online from your mobile apps are stored, and bring it then do machine learning and then do anal uh, analytics can be very time consuming, can be very complex. And then finally, as you build machine learning models, each model that you're building can take itself quite a bit of time. So how do you iterate creation and training period so that uh, you can uh, create, more experience, uh, ex create more experiments um, to optimize your models. And so that's where BigQuery machine learning comes into play. Let me just, this is probably better. Uh, let me uh, describe a little bit about BigQuery machine learning. Essentially, with standard SQL in the cloud, you can run machine learning models, uh, whereas you know, normally you would have to Python uh, and then run your machine learning models, but now you can bring the machine learning models directly to where the data is currently stored. Uh, which would be potentially in, in BigQuery. The way that um, BigQuery machine learning is kind of uh, in Google Cloud is that if we start from the lower level, you know, with uh, machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow and, and so on, and as you move up to be higher and higher abstractions from uh, working with deep learning uh, virtual machine images, Flow, I'll talk about AI platform, um, you know, as we go higher and higher, then we're talking more about application developers and data analysts. As we go lower and lower, we're talking more about machine learning engineers and data scientists. So BigQuery allows you to quickly build machine learning models with, with SQL uh, at ease. And there's a lot of public data sets that allow you to help you know, learn and get the feel of what BigQuery machine, machine learning kind of feels like. And, and, and you get to experiment with, with uh, machine learning with these public data sets, which I'll show you in a second. So essentially, with BigQuery machine learning, um, well, let me first talk about what, it's, what the process for data science is like without BigQuery machine learning and what it's like with BigQuery machine learning. So first, um, traditionally, when it comes to machine learning pipelines, uh, you first identify the problem that you're trying to, let's say, predict or do some clustering or build some recommendation engines with, and pre-process your data. You split your data into train test and validation data sets. You then build your machine learning models, train and evaluate your models. Then you have to find somewhere to deploy your models, and it's often actually rely on data engineers or application developers to help them deploy models. And then finally, you use those models, and then you try to make predictions. With BigQuery machine learning, you're trying to simplify that a lot uh, by reducing the number of 
involved that a data scientist or a data analyst were required to do. So you have the problem, you have the data set, you run some SQL statements to build your machine learning model, and that trains, it also does evaluation, and also does the single step, and then finally it's up to you just go ahead and make predictions. So before I move too, too much further, I'd like to show you a quick demo of uh, machine, uh, BigQuery machine learning in action. Who've, who've never seen BigQuery on Google Cloud Platform before, uh, this is the sandbox interface. It's the UI that allows you to write SQL statements and basically look at all of your tables and data sets uh, that you have available to you. So I'm in this BigQuery uh, environment, and to get here, I'm, I'm on this GCP uh, uh, console. On the left-hand side, I've simply navigated to BigQuery, and as I click BigQuery, this is the screen that I, that I get to. Okay? So here in Scenario, I have the query editor. This is where I can write my SQL statements. Below is kind of where I would see the results for BigQuery. On the bottom left-hand side, I have all of my data sets and my tables that I have access to. Um, so we have, for example, my project for Polon. I also have access to some public um, uh, databases uh, and, and tables within those and, and data sets within those as well. And so uh, what I'd like to show you is first some of my that show us how we can run BigQuery machine learning. So the first step is seeing how we can generate a predictive model on the New York City uh, TRIPS uh, data set uh, for, for cabs. Open this up to show you what it's like. So here we have this data set um, for NYC taxi trips. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a model to predict uh, the fair amount for that taxi cab off of some of the features, like uh, where they were picked up, where they were dropped off, and the number of passengers. It's a fairly simple kind of, uh, kind of example use case here. And I'm also um, do, running this model on a clean training uh, data set that comes from one of the... So if you would like to you know, try running this uh, on your own as well afterwards, um, you, know, you can run BigQuery machine learning on essentially any of these public data sets uh, at scale. So it's a great way to kind of practice uh, there. Yes. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time. It's going to take about a minute, minute and a half or so. And essentially what it's doing, it's doing not only pre-processing, but also training the model and also deploying all in uh, one step. I've created that SQL statement, hit run, and it's going to take a bit of time because uh, it's scaling out across lots of nodes and bringing that model back together into a single uh, result. And that result is essentially this table here on the left-hand side, model underscore lin reg. So if you look at the code here, what I've done is I've created or replaced a model uh, under this data set, serverless uh, ML, under this model called regression, and I've asked it to uh, choose the input label columns as a fair amount. That's kind of what we're trying to uh, predict. And then uh, the model type as linear regression. Okay? And so with that, it generates this underscore linear regression. Now, with this table, this is essentially the machine learning model that's been built with BigQuery. I can now use this to make predictions. Um, but before we make predictions, why don't we try to evaluate how well this model is performing? So let me go back to my save queries, to my project queries, evaluate the model, and I'm just going to open that here, open query. And then I'm running, essentially, ml.evaluate on the model that we had just created. And it shows us some... Uh, metrics that we can use to infer how well this model is performing, like uh, MAE, mean squared error, mean squared log error, uh, mean uh, median absolute error, and so on. Okay? Now we have this model and it's been trained and it's now kind of stored here almost as a table here. How can we use it? Well, we can use this to predict on new data that's coming in. So as, we, as I go back to my safe queries, I can open up my prediction. And here, what I've done is use this uh, function, machine learning, or ml.predict, brought in this model for model linear regression. I select the same data, just from a different uh, source, so that it's not using the same as the training data set. And then if I run it, it will give me the predictions uh, for the fair amount for these uh, New York City taxi cab rides. So we have a column called predicted fair amount. 
and these are the predictions versus the actual uh, data set itself. Now, it's not doing the best since I haven't customized it and tweaked all the hyperparameters, but this is a, just a three-step process in showing you how to machine learning models with BigQuery. Um, so just going back here, to summarize, right? So with BigQuery machine learning, you can train and deploy machine learning models without having to move your big data out of your data query. And then you can iterate on these models by you know, changing up your SQL queries. And you can also interface with other languages like R and Python to help augment some of your queries to help increase how, how quickly uh, you train your models and you know, parameters to, to tune your models as well. And because you're training and deploying all in a single step, you can make your predictions directly without having to worry about where to deploy your model and you know, uh, you know, trying to find the right person to help you deploy your model or trying to find a deploy server that helps you run the model. Um, it's all done in a single step, so you can start making predictions uh, using the model right away at, at scale. So as data comes into BigQuery, you can run machine learning on that with some of the models that you've generated and trained. So to recap, you know, we've, we've built and trained models with create model. Um, We've uh, used ml.predict to predict the model. And, um, and we've covered only linear regression so far. But ML has support for a number of different models. Some of them are still currently in private alpha, but they'll be uh, released publicly uh, in some time. Um, so k-means clustering uh, is out. Uh, you can run linear regression. And there's going to be support for XGBoost, importing TensorFlow models. Uh, you can do some pre-processing or extra pre-processing. Um, and for TensorFlow, you can you know, import classifiers and regressors directly into where your data is stored as well. So we've kind of covered this already, the demo. Um, just to quickly show you the different kinds of machine learning algorithms for those who may not be familiar, uh, if you're working with unsupervised machine learning, you may want to look at something like clustering to see how your data is you know, grouped together based off of similar characteristics. Whereas on the left-hand side, it's more around supervised machine learning. And under supervised machine learning, there's different kinds of, I guess, categories of techniques. So if you want to classify something that's classification, of course, you want to try to predict a continuous variable, that's regression. And if you want to build recommendation engines, that's matrix factorization. So all these are supported uh, or will be supported uh, in BigQuery machine learning. Linear regression, fairly straightforward trying to fit the best uh, line, uh, line of best fit. Um, logistic regression, trying to predict categorical outcomes, right? So, you know, yes or no versus success versus failure. XGBoost, um, if you're not familiar, it's became quite, quite popular, particularly through um, one of the platforms, uh, Kaggle. So if you're not familiar with Kaggle, Kaggle is a competitions web website for data scientists, allowing you to test to see how well you can predict something that a company or an organization is trying to you know, predict. In this case, um, this was a competition to try to, uh, I think, uh, detect duplicate ads or something like that. And um, the, the number one model uh, that, that came out of it was actually Boost. And this, is, this, this kind of generated a lot of uh, news, essentially, because uh, the first place uh, uh, essentially, just ran XGBoost as is by changing different seeds and getting the, uh, the top most result or the, the most popular result from, from, from the XGBoost. So uh, XGBoost became very popular, and it's a great tool for And uh, I think it can also be used for regression as well. Deep neural networks, of course, um, so building TensorFlow models outside and then bringing that into BigQuery is a possibility. And k-means clustering, uh, so again, to data points based off of similarity. It can also be used to reduce dimensions. So um, if you have lots of data points on behavior and you want to uh, reduce the number of you know, different kinds of actions that people are taking on a particular website, you want to cluster them into different kinds of categories or buckets of behavior, you can use something like k-means clustering. And then finally, uh, you can also use k-means clustering to spot anomalies as well. So as you can see in this uh, little animation, uh, this data set, you know, suppose it has you know, features X and Y and you're plugging it on this graph. And as we look at how the data is shaped, you could say maybe there's, you know, two clusters of data. And, you know, the green and the, and the yellow here. But as you increase the number of 
clusters that you're looking for, maybe you might find something like this, where you have green, yellow, and uh, the purple cluster of data set, uh, of, of, of clusters, of data points. The way it can actually be used to spot anomalies is if you calculate the distance between new data points to its nearest uh, cluster and then the centroid closest to, its set, uh, to, to the centroid, that's one way to detect how far off it is from any. And then number two is if you actually have, you know, let's say we have the XY coordinates um, extending actually beyond the slide towards, the, towards your right and towards, uh, I guess, the ceiling. If you have a data set in the far corner, it could actually uh, generate a cluster, or you could actually find a cluster that only ties itself to that particular data point towards the wall. And so if you have clusters, essentially, that have very few data points, whereas every other cluster has thousands of data points, hundreds of data points, or much more number of data points, then you know that that cluster that has very few data points actually could be some sort of uh, anomaly. So uh, different ways in which you could use uh, k-means clustering to you know, help you uh, from some of your data. Some examples that have been used uh, with BigQuery machine learning, um, I really like this one is, uh, so uh, who here uses Stack Overflow, whether to help you with your code or to ask, of course, all of us. Uh, and the question that Felipe Hoffa, so he's a fellow developer advocate at Google, the question that he asked was, if you write a question on Stack Overflow, how long will it take for someone to reply to you? And how long will it take based off of when you submitted your question and what kind of words you used to submit your question. So there's actually an interactive dashboard where you can actually fill in some of these um, features and then try to see how long it takes uh, for people to respond. According to these particular settings, you know, what day is it today? Monday. OK, what time is it? Seven. Uh, how, uh, did you write your, a long question versus a short question? A short question. What was the first word of your question title? Is it why or how? Else? And does the title end with a question mark and so on? And using BigQuery machine learning, because there's a whole lot of stack overflow questions out there, um, and you use this to quickly generate these insights. Well, given all these settings, the answer is 84.77%. And then it'll t probably take them around 51 uh, minutes uh, to respond, with an 11% chance of being downloaded as well. So another kind of funny thing that I was looking at as well what if you change the first word of your question title to be something different? Or if, if you started with Y versus if you started a question with I, how does that change the results of how likely someone will respond to your question? And it turns out that probably it increases by 2x if you start your question with the word I. Um, so you know, without knowing further context, maybe uh, that's something to keep in mind next time you ask a question the title. Uh, using BigQuery machine learning, model was exported into, um, into the cloud somewhere. So it's in cloud storage uh, under this uh, model path. And then within BigQuery machine learning, he connects to that specifying model type is equal to TensorFlow path is equal to that particular location where his TensorFlow model is stored. And then he does uh, you know, ML.predict afterwards. So ML.predict using that model that was created and then selecting more data that, um, that comes in and try to classify um, with the right you know, um, news source. So uh, here are some of the results uh, with the title like, Unlikely Partnership In-House Gives Lawmakers Hope for a Border Deal, predicted to be uh, New York Times, Fitbit's newest uh, Fitbit for employees and health insurance members, that's for TechCrunch, and then uh, and so on and so forth. So interesting ways in which you can kind of uh, use BigQuery uh, machine learning and TensorFlow combined together. So I kind of went through the BigQuery Center that was the console that I showed you here. Um, and what I like about this console here, personally, is that it gets you up and running with BigQuery very quickly. So if you have uh, a GCP account, actually, if you don't even have a GCP account, get into your um, Gmail and then start using this sandbox environment right away without having to import your credit card. Um, so lots of cloud providers do that, right? So you have to put in your credit card. But with BigQuery, you don't have to. And you can start querying up one terabyte of data uh, per month uh, for free. Uh, and then afterwards, I think it'll start asking you for your credit card because you'll be using quite a bit. Um, but uh, this is one way to use BigQuery. But there's many different ways to use BigQuery. Um, the reason why I actually, in practice, avoid using this console is because, as, as you kind of saw as I was presenting, trying to go back into my saved queries 
um, you know, clicking on project queries, clicking on uh, this, opening that query in editor, and then clicking run, that's like seven steps. And as a developer, that's seven, like six steps too many. Um, what I prefer to do is be able to, you know, quickly create my SQL statements, to change it up, and see the results kind of in flow, right? In a document kind of format. So what I prefer to do is, is Jupyter Notebooks. And so what you can do is you can run BigQuery machine learning directly from a notebook. So this could be with Colab Notebooks, this could be with Jupyter Lab Notebooks, or Jupyter Notebooks, uh, anything uh, would, would be fine. Um, and you just need to install the Google Cloud dash uh, BigQuery uh, package. There's one for so for Python users, it's Google Cloud BigQuery, or there's a different package called BigR Query, or I believe. Um, and then you input your GCP credentials, and then you can go ahead and just start writing your BigQuery statements, right? So it's 2% styles, percent signs, you're using this magic function in Jupyter Notebooks. And then you can run your SQL query uh, directly and get some results. So here I'm just looking at the, uh, the headers, and then here I'm looking at the number of rows, looking at you know, the, the data frame. Um, you can export it from BigQuery directly into a Pandas data frame and then do more in Pandas if you wanted to. That's what you'd like. Uh, and of course, as you go into uh, running things with BigQuery machine learning, because everything is and so far you've seen stuff done in SQL already, uh, you simply write your SQL statements to create or replace your table, uh, create or replace your model, ML predict, and then you can run your linear regression models, logistic regression, k-means clustering, and so on. So everything can be done essentially uh, within this new notebook environment, which as a data scientist I would uh, very much uh, enjoy using. Um, so I can see the results from one model, change up the see the results from the new model, compare and contrast, and keep iterating until I find the most appropriate model that I like. So I have this notebook here that shows different kinds of uh, models, um, which I won't go into. I wanted to cover something else here as well, but the gist of working with BigQuery machine learning within these notebooks. Now, you can use BigQuery, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, with Python and with R. So if you're using Python, uh, Python users or people who predominantly use Python, hands up for those who prefer to use R. Okay, uh, I I, uh, I I started off with um, Python, R, and then back to Python. So I use both, but in my mind, when I'm writing, you know, my uh, statements, I tend to think in R. Uh, but then in practice, I end up using Python a lot more, just because my colleagues tend to use both my previous job and my current job, people tend to use Python a little bit more. So, uh, but in any case, um, for Python, if you're a Python user, you can use Jupyter Notebooks, you can use Colab Notebooks, and if they're not enough, then you can scale out to what are called AI Platform Notebooks. Next, about. And then if you use R, uh, you can use R Studio, you can use notebooks that use the R kernel, if you like, um, and then you can run your uh, SQL statements there. And then if you want, if that's not, um, you know, if you're data sets, um, then you can use AI platform notebooks on Google Cloud. Um, so I'll, I'll skip. Okay, so just a quick sh uh, demonstration of AI platform notebooks. So um, here's the Google Cloud platform main page. So as you log in, this is the screen that you see. This is my project, Polong dash BigQuery. On the left-hand side, as you navigate this um, large list of uh, services on Google Cloud, it's often quite hard to find the right product you want. Uh, but if you scroll down, uh, you'll find under artificial intelligence AI platform. And this is essentially writing, uh, sorry, uh, generating notebook instances that help you, uh, you know, run Jupyter Lab in the cloud at whatever kind of um, particular VM uh, you'd like. So, for example, this one I've created is one that's, you know, in the United States. It's using uh, NumPy, SciPy, Scikit-Learn, uh, the basic libraries pre-installed, and these are, you know, my machine type settings. But if I wanted to, I could create a new one. I could choose one for R, pre-installed, installed, 
I wanted to use TensorFlow. Um, the new version, or the enterprise version, which still, I believe, uses the old 1.x version. PyTorch, um, I'm not familiar with this one, actually. And then with CUDA, uh, with CUDA uh, let's say with R. And then it'll give you a, like a, a default setting. And then you can say, oh, this is good enough or this is not good enough. You can customize that. Click on Customize. And then you can choose um, you know, your region, deploy your instance to, uh, what environment you want to use, the machine configuration. So here, it's not only just about CPUs and RAM. You can also choose uh, G GPUs as well, if you choose the right setting, of course. You can create. And as you create it, uh, let me go back here, you create this little line. And you can click on Open uh, Jupyter Lab. So as you click on it, it launches Jupyter Lab in the cloud as if uh, locally on your computer. So it's simply a, a link to you know, this URL, launches Jupyter Lab, and now it's running on a much larger um, computational resource than it would be via your machine. Great. So that is AI Platform Notebooks for R and Python, and you can you know, run your SQL statements uh, with BigQuery or generate your BQML um, from AI Platform as well. Um, OK, uh, quick summary, BigQuery uh, machine learning takeaways. You can create, evaluate, predict. Three simple steps that helps you train and deploy models very quickly where the data sits in BigQuery. The tables uh, persist. Sorry, the, the models persist as tables, allowing you to, uh, to kind of deploy and train in a single step, and it becomes production ready. And uh, right, so before I end, just want a quick uh, shout out to uh, this little thing that uh, some colleagues ha have launched, uh, which is a little bit of a big query challenge. So you can participate in this challenge. It's simply called, you know. Uh, test your data analysis skills with the pros. You create an account in BigQuery. Uh, you look at the queries below. You run those queries. And then as you submit them, you, you essentially enter yourself into a draw where you can potentially uh, win a special prize and be invited to join Felipe Hoffa, who is a developer advocate for BigQuery, um, for a live Hangouts uh, session or challenge for the next week's filming. So that's a pretty exciting uh, thing. You also get some extra uh, GCP credits, I believe, uh, by uh, you know, uh, winning this challenge. So it's very simple. You can go to Google or goo.goal slash BQ challenge um, to learn more. And uh, it's a great way to just kind of up and running with BigQuery. But that is uh, my, the presentation. So thank you very much. There's some extra resources here. There's a subreddit for BigQuery. So feel free to follow that or subscribe to it. Twitter handles uh, for Felipe and myself. Or we in machine learning data science. There's also a really great book that's been recently released um, this, no, last month in October called Big Google BigQuery, The Definitive Guide. Um, and so that's a really great resource for learning more around BigQuery. And, um, but aside from that, um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn or follow me on Twitter. Uh, thank you very much.